today to conduct this webinar, uh, especially on the insistence of my mentor, Dr. Sh Shabi Zaidi. Uh, this was a long introduction. I was not expecting that. Nevertheless, I will tell you my most important introduction is that I'm one of the founding members along with Dr. Marhum Muhammad Ali, Dr. Shwaji Rizvi of the ISO, Imamiya Student Organization at Dow Medical College in the 1970s. And I take a great pride in what especially Waji and the IMI has accomplished since then. I would also like to congratulate the leader of the SIUV, AVU, for organizing these webinars. They have done an outstanding job in bringing some of the wonderful uh, webinars, uh, leading all the way from nursing in COVID to so many other important topics which are needed at this time, uh, especially under the leadership of Dr. Shabi Hedar Zaidi. Finally, uh, I have no words how to appreciate what Dr. Waji Rizbi and his team in New Jersey and otherwise at the IMI headquarters have done, along with Dr. Arshad Kayumi, who is the chair of the Academic Council of IMI. And the list goes on and on, and you guys are very familiar and aware of this. In terms of today's symposia, I would say it's a highly uh, innovative, timely, required, demanded, uh, more or less, symposia on the new educational technologies uh, in this new world order. What COVID have done, on one hand, has created catastrophes. On the other hand, has truly brought so many of us so close to each other. So many of us, especially when it comes to education, even major institutes like Harvard, Duke, uh, uh, Stanford, as you know, are, have all gone online. And I think it's a great opportunity for organization like IMI and SIVU to take the lead in educating our community and our physicians, our other colleagues in healthcare to process this and move it forward. And thank you very much for the team, uh, Asnan, Shifa, and others to do that. As I said, the focus of today's symposia will be how we can best utilize these new IT te technologies to educate ourselves, educate our students, educate others, and that expands not just limited to medical students, doctors, but even beyond that, so that we can work together in serving the humanity. We have a world-class distinguished experts today who will be talking about these technologies um, in this regard. And my, to just to set the ground rule, so our speakers will introduce themselves briefly, will provide about 10 to 12 minutes of presentation. Uh, our moderator, Dr. Hasnan, will allow one to two questions. Hasnan, please so that we stay on time. Our focus is about 45 minutes to an hour, no more beyond that. So with that, we will at the end open up for discussion. And thank you very much, everybody. And so I will ask now our first speaker, Dr. Riley, to introduce herself and to uh, do the presentation. Thank you so much. Asalaamu Alaikum. Hasnan, over to you. Thanks, thanks Prof. Uh, yes, Dr. Shaleh. 
Uh, hello, everyone. I have to thank Dr. Shabi and SIU team and Dr. Hossein for this introduction that he provided for every one of us. Uh, it is a pleasure and honor for me to be with all of you at this symposium or webinar. And uh, I'm Associate Professor of Medical Education at Iran University of Medical Sciences and at the same time working at Center for Educational Research and Medical Sciences, Iran University of Medical Sciences. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, let me share my screen with you all. Just... Please do. Sure. That's me. MashaAllah, very good. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to briefly introduce my colleagues in this webinar, Dr. Rita Mushtahezadeh from Tehran University of Medical Sciences, Dr. Ayn Muhammadi from Tehran University of Medical Sciences, and Dr. Manish Mehrabi from Shiraz University of Medical Sciences. All of us are second affiliated uh, faculties of Virtual University of Medical Sciences. Uh, if I want to have a brief overview of what we're going to talk about today, first we are going to uh, talk about some new educational technologies that are prevalent these days. We are going to talk about a hype card, a very, a very brief description about it, and we are going to talk about mobile learning, micro learning, big data analysis, and digital literacy. As you see in this slide, uh, these days we have an increasing demand for accountability in higher education. In other words, all the educational institutes are more responsive, responsible, and accountable. This demand has increased the focus on improved teaching and learning, and you see that the cycle goes on and on in order to be uh, more focus on improved teaching and learning, they have to be more accountable, learn to be more accountable, they have to improve teaching and learning. One of the issues that I want to attract your attention to is uh, e-learning prediction hype curve. Usually two institutes in the world uh, provide this hype curve. One of them is Gartner and the other one is Coursework. As you see in this hype curve, you see the predictions that will happen in the future of e-learning. From this curve for today, as you see, we chose learning analytics or big data analysis, micro learning, mobile learning, and digital literacy to be presented today. We have another webinar on September the 5th, in which we are going to talk about other aspects of new technologies that are used for medical education. Now, I want to talk about mobile learning, or in other words, M-learning. I think every one of us have this experience, especially in this COVID era uh, crisis, everyone has used mobile devices. And, uh, I want to attract your attention to this slide. Please have a look at the left picture. You see a traditional classroom, a classroom which is based on physical environments. The teacher uses a whiteboard, have closed the curtains, and the students have uh, papers in front of themselves. So look at their faces, they are not happy. And the teacher says you have to turn off your mobile phones. That is a cartoon of a traditional classroom. Why in this era, with the advent of technology, we see at the right side another teacher. This teacher has based his classroom on educational technologies. He's telling his students to turn their mobiles on. You see that the curtains are off. There is a computer instead of a whiteboard in the classroom. And every one of the students have their mobile devices in their hands. 
In other words, if we want to explain more about mobile technologies and mobile devices that can be used for teaching and learning, our students have to have their smartphones, mobile phones or tablets with themselves in the classrooms. I apologize, there's some issues with slide sharing. Okay, let's have a look at this slide. As you see in this slide, our best instrument that is mobile and helps us to learn at any time and anywhere is our brain. We have our brain with us. We go from one place to another place and uh, without our brain, which is our instrument of teaching and learning, we cannot be successful. Brain gives us this opportunity to learn at any time and any place. Our brain or human brain has the capacity to collect, store and process information and it is mobile. It is with us everywhere, the same as our digital mobile devices, the same happens to our brain. And one of the most important characteristics of mobile learning or mobile teaching is that it can be used at any time, but anyone and anywhere. There is no limitation to location. People are not buying to the spaces and they can uh, use their devices to learn at any time that they desire. The most important part of this kind of teaching and learning is that we have learner centricity. Time is flexible. The student can use it anytime. They receive instant feedback from their classmates because it encourages collaborative learning or they can give feedback instantly to their teachers. We have location flexibility. Any place it's possible to learn. Uh, the mobile devices are usually light. They are small. And uh, personal preferences play a major role in this kind of learning. People can learn according to their needs, wants, and desires. They can repeat the courses several times or go through the content more and more. Another possibility that is helpful in this regard are mobile networks. We have, they have to have accessibility to mobile networks. This kind of learning encourages social interactivity and people are encouraged to engage more and more and to be more in touch with each other. However, there are some mobile learning disadvantages that uh, are mentioned in different texts. One of them is multiple information resources. In other words, our learners can refer to different resources and some of these resources are not written by experts. They are contradictions when you surf the web and you find information there. Another problem is the equipment cost because usually people uh, have to have new devices and to gain a new device, they have to pay more and more. So it's one of the problems that it's not to the benefit of disadvantage of the students. Another one is device abuses. Sometimes people, instead of paying attention to the content and study the material, they prefer to surf the web and go to different websites and create fun themselves for themselves instead of studying. Sometimes operating costs are very high and to uh, gain access to internet becomes very difficult. Another story is device addiction or internet addiction that was uh, mentioned in the literature by Professor Kimberly Young. Sometimes people get addicted to their devices and they have fragmentation in learning time and learning time is not something that happens in the classes that are physical or traditional classes. So these are mentioned in the text among some of the 
these advantages for mobile learning. As you see in this slide, there are some challenges that texts have dealt with. One of them is the challenge of design. Sometimes the applications that are used for mobile devices are not designed in a way uh, to uh, answer or to respond to the needs, wants, and desires of the students or teachers. Therefore, they have to design it right for their own souls and they can use different application platforms which can give them uh, this possibility to design the applications for themselves. And the ready-made applications design sometimes do not suffice. From technical point of view, sometimes there are some um, applications which work on iOS systems or on Apple systems. Therefore, uh, these are not compatible with each other and people cannot use them instead of each other on, on different devices. Sometimes teacher and the students have the same brand of devices and this helps them uh, to exchange the content with each other. And those who uh, do not have, for example, the same brand as the teacher become disadvantaged because they cannot use those contents. The, uh, the applications that are made sometimes are socially or culturally dependent. It means that they are suitable for a specific sociocultural environment and um, it must be adapted to other uh, situations. There is a problem with management. At the institutional level, if there is no internet connection at a good speed, uh, institute needs LMS or learning management system. And at the student level, because the students uh, have to control their learning and to direct their learning, it becomes a bit difficult because teachers are not with them all the time. Another problem is the challenge of evaluation. To evaluate the students via this mode of teaching and learning is somehow difficult. And although uh, they can design different quizzes and exams, but sometimes uh, they are in doubt of the uh, accuracy of the exams and the truth of them. If I want to summarize what I mentioned up to now, I could say that we have different mobile devices and as you see in this picture, mobile phones, or smartphones, tablets, and laptops. They can be used for distance learning. They are not fine to location, they're not going to space, and they can be used at any time, anywhere, and when people are on move, they can use these devices freely. And as you see in this picture, the traditional classroom training is changed to e-learning in a while ago, and now mobile learning has taken its place and people are uh, using mobile devices much more than before and especially in this COVID era that it has come a major need. And one more point thing that I want to refer to is that uh, in different classes, teachers and learners when use their mobile devices, they can be in touch with each other at the same time and teacher can send a message to his students and all of them receive the message. And there's one more point that uh, to use these devices as necessary to become familiar with the vocabulary that is used for uh, mobile learning. Thank you very much and I'm ready to answer the two questions if there's any. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and a very general presentation. My quick question would be, I mean, obviously you have pointed out to some of the difficulties that we may have, especially in third world, where all these kinds of technologies may not be available. How do you think the future, uh, we can address this, especially in our community? Uh you know, I, I can say that 
Uh, it's mostly dependent on mobile networks and on devices. And I think it's the role of the governments to provide these facilities for the public or the institutions, educational institutions in some part of the world, they provide the devices and they give their students the opportunity to access network. So I think it's not something that could be done by people alone and need the support from societies and public education, I think. But because the trend is changing and uh, mobile learning has become more and more prevalent these days. I think uh, it's good to have this led to the future and to consider that it is going to gain attention for all the societies, even the disadvantaged ones has to be prepared to have some room for it. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask the next speaker now? To introduce themselves briefly and go to the presentation. Thank you. It was a wonderful presentation, as Thank well as the much. slides were very, very helpful. Thank you. Please, you stop your sharing. Yes, yeah, stop sharing. Yeah, I'll stop. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome to this webinar. Firstly, I would like to thank uh, SIVU organizers of this webinar series. Thank you, Professor Shadi and his team. And also, I would like to thank Professor Hossein and uh, dear Hassan for uh, handling this session. Uh, actually, I'm Rita Moshehezade, faculty member of Tehran University of Medical Sciences. I am a medical doctorate in, in my background, and I have PhD in uh, e-learning planning. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. And also, I am second affiliated faculty member of Virtual University of Medical Sciences in Iran, and the main responsible body for developing the national LMS MOOCs uh, platform for Iranian universities. Uh, in this session, I'm going to have a brief talk on micro learning, which is a micro lecture by itself, I can say. And micro learning, we are going to look at it as a, a new trend in uh, education and e-learning, which should be applied in our teaching learning process. Okay, let me start my presentation with a question. What do you know about micro learning? I would like to, you to reflect on this uh, question by your own. And I'm going to ask uh, three questions, uh, which, has, uh, which have two answers, and you're going to choose the answers for yourself. The first question, and these questions are all about the myth on micro learning, you know, in the literature and the, in the mind of people. The first question, micro learning is all about duration or focus. Which one do you choose? I would like uh, to ask you to think of it and choose your answer. I suppose that most of you have chosen the correct answer and this is micro learning is all about the focus and not the duration of the content. And we are going to discuss a bit more about this question uh, in our journey. Now, let, let's go through the second one. Micro learning is just or may include videos. Which one do you choose? Yes, I suppose that we can choose micro learning may include videos. So micro learning is not equal to multimedia e-content or videos. And now let's go to the last question. Micro learning replaces or augments everything else. Which one do you choose as the correct answer? Uh, I think I should thank you if you have chosen augments. Micro learning augments everything else. It doesn't substitute anything in teaching learning process. Now that you have thought of these uh, three questions and you have reflected 
and reviewed your knowledge about micro learning, let's go through, let's go through the answer for WH questions in English regarding micro learning concepts. And we are going to start with what? What is micro learning? Actually, microlearning is learning in smaller steps. It could be a small learning units or short-term learning activities. But the shared characteristic here is being uh, brief. Brevity and being concise is the shared characteristics. And by being brief, we mean the chunks of four to eight minutes uh, assets or activities. So, in another words, microlearning is breaking up the training course into short focused pieces that are only as long as they need to be. So they are just to point. And this helps us to make our uh, course scientific, effective, and easy to learn. Now let's go to the second WH question. Why is micro learning used? Let's go through some benefits of micro learning. It reduces cognitive load for the learners. It improves learning retention and facilitates point in time training. In addition, it encourages autonomous learning for learners and learners enjoy it a lot. And also it provides teachers for better tracking system and method. And the last one is it is actually more affordable for the system to uh, create such micro learning content. And now that we have uh, reviewed some of the benefits, let's go to who? Who enjoys micro learning? Can you think of the answer by yourself? Who do you think would enjoy micro learning? Undergraduate students, postgraduate ones, younger ones, older ones, who? The answer is easy, everyone, including ourselves. I think all of us, we enjoy uh, micro learning, assets of learning. And the next question is regarding when. When is micro learning used? Look at this slide. Here you can see that when you're going to uh, learn something for the first time and you're going to learn more about it, you are going through uh, uh, gaining deep learning. And after that, you are going to apply learn things and you are going to be able to decide when things go wrong or when things change. As you see in the slide, uh, micro learning works the best for the uh, third three, third last steps of learning that are applying the learn things and deciding for special occasions. And somehow it would work for learning more about the subject. But it is said in the literature that when you are going to learn a complicated concept or fact for the first time, maybe micro learning is not the best solution. And now, uh, during our journey, we, uh, we are going to answer where is micro learning used. The answer is easy again, everywhere. For postgraduate training, undergraduate training, for workplace training, CMEs and academic skills, everywhere you can enjoy from micro learning strategy. And the last and most important question is, how is micro learning designed? Uh, would you please think of it a bit for yourself? How would you design a course regarding micro learning approach. Uh, pay attention, micro learning is delivery is not just delivering micro videos or multimedia e-content. You can have micro assignments, you can deliver some tips, short videos, short scenarios and quizzes, case studies, and even games, and every other strategies that you use in teaching learning process could be designed in micro approach. But the only point is just following brevity, being concise and being concise, you know? This is the main point that we should follow when we are going to design something as, a, as micro assets. 
And the most important point here is that when you are going to uh, redesign your course for delivering in micro learning assets, you should rethink of your content. It is not the fact of just chunking your course into small pieces, maybe for example, four to eight minutes mini lectures. You should redesign it. And the point is that it is not just uh, telling simple things to your students, lecturing simple things. The misconcept that some of faculty, some of our faculty members have is that when they are going to design a micro learning lecture or asset, they think of easy parts of their course. No, this is not the fact. You should rethink up your course and you should redesign it in a way that it could be focused and concise but maybe it is uh, related to a, one of the complicated parts of your uh, course. And usually the other point is that you should use multimedia to gain attention, but pay attention. Uh, do not exaggerate for using uh, multimedia in your uh, assets and contents. It, it is, they are not used to make our content pretty. They are used to enhance learning and we should pay attention to this point. And also the other point is that you can use other strategies along the uh, micro learning to boost the engagement of your learners. Some of them could be gamification, space learning that I love it. It's a really, it's really an interesting uh, strategy. Mobile based micro learning that Shola talked about, uh, augmented and virtual reality and so on. And think of micro assessment as well when you are uh, delivering your course in micro assets of contents and activities, it is good to think of micro assessment as well uh, while you are delivering the course. And as a conclusion, pay attention. Please pay attention that micro learning isn't just a strategy, it's a mindset. You should rethink of your paradigm of teaching learning and you should be able to believe in this sentence that lighter is heavier. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm ready for question and answer. Thank you, Rita. Thank you so much. Any questions for Dr. Zadzada, please. So there was an interesting question uh, which is coming through and that was, what is the difference between micro learning and micro teaching? Rita. Okay, uh, I, I suppose that the concept is like the difference between teaching and learning, you know? When you are talking of learning, you are thinking of learner-centered strategies. You uh, put the student at the center of uh, what you plan you know, but teaching, when you are talking of teaching, this is, um, you can say that more uh, teacher-centered strategies, and they come together, you know, we always say that we have teaching dash learning process, so when we are de delivering our content in micro assets, we are teaching in micro teaching strategies assets as well, you know, we should be innovative to combine this teaching dash learning. And now when it comes to micro learning, it would be micro teaching dash micro learning process. Great. Thank you very much. Any other question? Wonderful. Let's move to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Aheem Mohammadi. Please, Dr. Mohammadi, if you could introduce yourself and again, a brief presentation with one or two questions. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Aim Mohammadi. I'm physician and medical educationist, faculty member of Tehran University of Medical Sciences and uh, vice chancellor of infrastructure of Virtual University of Medical Sciences. Uh, firstly, I want to thank uh, to all organizers of this uh, webinar, especially Professor Hossein and uh, Professor Baluch, and uh, uh, all participants that have managed to uh, be participated in this webinar. I'm going to uh, discuss briefly about big data and 
uh, its influence on medical uh, education, on future of medical education. So let's uh, have a definition from big data. As you know, big data are extremely large data sets that may be analyzed to reveal patterns, uh, trends, and associations, especially relating to human behavior and interactions. Uh, in fact, big data is a term that describes the large volume of data. Uh, a few years ago, we said that uh, data which are too uh, large to be uh, analyzed with the routine statistical software uh, such as SPSS are called big data. Uh, but of course, new versions of SPSS have solved this uh, problem. Okay, big data uh, have many applications uh, for uh, health cares, but, uh, and other disciplines. And uh, the most important applications of big data are shown in this slide, banking, communication, uh, entertainment, transportation, and insurance. But we focus on medical care and education in this presentation. As you see in this slide, the opportunities of big data analytics in health care uh, are summarized. Clin clinical decision support systems, telemedicine, personalized medicine, fraud management, preventive health care, predictive uh, epidemics like uh, COVID-19, uh, etc. And uh, I will discuss more about each of them. On the other hand, data-driven sciences like machine learning and artificial intelligence have the potential to drive important changes in medicine. But we know, we should notice that, uh, we should note that medical education have uh, different aspects uh, from other disciplines of science. Uh, the most important of them are legal, ethical, uh, regulatory, economical, and societal dependencies. So this progress must be accompanied by parallel changes in the global environment and other stakeholders, including citizens and uh, society. As most of you may know, big data characteristics uh, are shown in uh, six Vs. In this slide, these six Vs uh, have been translated to uh, its application in medical care and medical education. Uh, value uh, shows uh, that the data in medical cares are better to be uh, driven from longitudinal studies. Volume shows uh, it's high volume because of continuous monitoring of vital signs in medicine. Velocity shows it's high speed uh, because of the importance of clinical decision uh, speed and fast clinical decision supports. Variety shows it's a heterogeneous and uh, unstructured manner. Uh, veracity shows that it's uh, this uh, big data in medical sciences and medical education are usually inaccurate and variability shows its seasonal health effects and disease evolution. That's uh, one of the best examples for this V is uh, COVID-19. To elaborate more about uh, the sum of uh, the source of data, we can say that the turning point came in 2013 when the federal government began granting public access to hundreds of healthcare sets from Medicare and Medicaid. This windfall of information offered valuable insights into myriad facets of patient care, from tests and diagnosis to cost and uh, outcomes. In fact, a premise of big data is that those daily interaction captured through medical encounters health behaviors and other data produced for a variety of purposes can uh, be the source material for vast amount of medical uh, research. This 
this slide uh, shows one of the most important aspects of big data, integrating uh, it into the curriculum of uh, undergraduate and postgraduate uh, disciplines. It is time for medical schools to consider uh, content focused uh, on machine learning and uh, augmented, uh, uh, sorry, uh, artificial intelligence and its application as part of the, the curriculum. Medical students, residents, and fellows should have knowledge of these data science, uh, science during their training period. If uh, someone is uh, interested in, I can introduce the a curriculum of New York University as a good sample of integrating uh, data driven sciences into its uh, curriculum. We can use big data analysis to find patterns, support decisions, make predictions, uh, and uh, for the deep learning part, self identify important features in data. For learning from applications of uh, big data, uh, commercial enterprises and large companies are good examples like Google, Facebook, and uh, Amazon. Advanced data management and analysis is exemplified by leading information companies. For example, in Google, as you know, Google leverages the information from trillions of individual pages on the internet and develops programs and formulas to produce research results that match uh, its users' needs within a few uh, seconds. Uh, another example is Amazon. Amazon has improved its predictive analytics to the point that it now has a patent for anticipatory shipping, a method that one day they could lead to the shipping of products customers are expected to buy based on previous orders and other factors. Today, big companies uh, use new approaches like graph analysis. Graph analysis is a method of portraying data in three-dimensional uh, space and it uses nodes and edges rather than rows and columns. In medicine, uh, so, uh, such methods may improve classification of disease, reveals way to determine the influence of particular physicians on practice patterns or predict a patient's clinical events. There is a question why we need data uh, driven sciences. Uh, we need the, to, uh, for uh, better informed decisions, uh, we need better personalized the prediction about prognosis and response to treatment. We need a deeper understanding of the complex factors and their interactions that uh, influence health at the level of the patients, the health system and society. We need enhanced approaches to detecting safety problems with drugs and devices. And we need more effective methods of comparing preventive diagnostic and treatment options. Complexity of human being is another reason for using big data in future. As you know, the current paradigm in medicine often involve a reductionist framework that ultimately fails to provide information that is primed for the complexities of patients and medical practices. We routinely divide human beings to different organs and different systems and treat each of them separately. Big data approaches can retain the complexity of the data and illuminate the way that biological, demographical, clinical, and environmental factors interact with uh, each other to influence risk and outcomes. But there is a problem. As you know, okay. Okay. Uh, you know, we are drawing uh, in the ocean of data, uh, but uh, we start for knowledge. Uh, 
the growth data, the growth of data has an explosive uh, manner, but the question is what data can be useful for further actions. The solution is data mining, extraction of interesting patterns or knowledge from huge amounts of data, uh, but because of the social shortage of time, uh, this is not included in this presentation. Before big data was introduced to the healthcare system, the role of data in the treatment of a patient was limited. Hospitals would collect such patients' data as name, age, disease, descriptions, patient profile, medical reports, and family history of illnesses, whichever applicable. Such data provide a constrained view of the patient's health problem. But big data has added a dimension to the treatment of disease. Doctors now are able to understand disease better and deliver accurate personalized treatments. The first one is comprehensive view of disease. Big data has helped healthcare institutions take a 330 degree view of a patient health problems. This has led to new findings, novel treatment plans, and more accurate diagnosis. The other one is predicting disease, diseases. This follows the first uh, challenge actually. When a patient is treated, the healthcare institution is able to obtain huge uh, volume of meaningful data about the patient. Wearable devices. Wearable devices can do a wonderful job in detecting potential health problems even if there are no apparent symptoms. And uh, the last but not the least is personalized medicine. Impact of big data uh, on personalized medicine is too important. Experts believe that big data is going to increase the efficacy of personal uh, medicine significantly. A number of initiatives are on their way to find out why to improve the effectiveness of uh, personalized medicine. Another uh, application of big data is learning analytics, uh, especially in medical education. Uh, learning analytics is uh, the measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners and their context for purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. In fact, uh, learning analytics acts uh, as a bridge between description to prediction. This slide shows dimensions, dimensions of analytics. Learning analytics are a concept that have been emerging under a number of different names through the past decades. Its origin lies in researching data mining and intelligent tutoring systems. Learning analytics tools can be categorized in a number of ways. This diagram describes such tools by, now, uh, by how deeply they are integrating with other uh, systems. And finally, this is a historic uh, moment in medicine, I think. There is a remarkable opportunity to promote medicine as an information science uh, and, uh, sorry, and uh, the foundations, I lost my, okay, foundations of a learning uh, healthcare uh, systems. Uh, thank you uh, for attention and uh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammadi. It was an excellent presentation on a very broad uh, topic and you've concised it in such a nice way. However, we are running out of time. So I will ask our next speaker and the questions will be asked at the end, where if there are any other questions for you, then we can answer that. Uh, now I request uh, Sister Matarabi who can, um, Harabi, can do her presentation. Thank you. There we go. Um, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Salam. 
Um, hello and good day, everyone. First of all, I appreciate all uh, today's organizers from this Spectre International Virtual University uh, for holding such an informative webinar, Dr. Hossein uh, and uh, Dr. Hasnain and their Shifa. A special thanks to my dear Shole who invited me to this amazing experience. And I'm delighted that so many of you, I mean, uh, handwritten uh, 20 of you, uh, could attend in today's webinar, especially my dear colleagues from Shiraz University of Medical Sciences. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Manush Merabi. I'm a um, Dean Assistant of Virtual School of Shiraz University of Medical Sciences and uh, with second affiliation of uh, um, Virtual University of Medical Sciences, Terra. The subject of my presentation is, excuse me, yeah. The subject of my presentation is uh, digital literacy. This topic is very important to you because everyone would like to uh, know their level of information, knowledge, skills, uh, or in one word, literacy. As you can see on the screen, my presentation will cover what is digital literacy, why digital literacy is important, um, that because of shortage of time, maybe I pass, uh, skip this part, and how to be digitally literate. Uh, take a look at this picture. As same as something we see on the screen, some people seem to have remarkable skills, but actually they don't. We will get back to this picture at the end of my presentation where you can assess your abilities based on reality. The term digital literacy or digital uh, fluency builds on several historic literacy movement. In the past, we had literacy as reading and writing. In 1960s, the term media literacy was coined, uh, which, was, uh, which encompasses interpreting mass media. And in 1980s, we had information literacy, which was skepticism about content and critical thinking. And now we have digital literacy with all these definitions plus three extra components which are finding and consuming. I meant um, finding and consuming knowledge, for example, through searching, reading hyperlinks, creating contents through emails, blogs, tweets, in searching and communicating with Web2 tools or interactive tools and having internet behavior means that when and what to share your information. It is very important. American um, Library Association Digital Literacy Task Force defines it as the ability to use information and communication technologies. It means ICTs. To find means that searching I told you, evaluate somehow critical thinkings, create and communicate information requiring both cognitive and technical skills. We have three models of digital literacy. And um, one of them is universal literacy. And universal literacy is a familiarity with basic tools. For example, office software, image manipulation, using cloud-based technologies or web-based technologies. Then we have creative literacy. Creative literacy is something more than universal literacy and have uh, definitions of universal literacy in itself. And it is more challenging to produce richer content, including video, audio, animation, understanding computational devices, somehow programming, and along with digital citizenship, copyright knowledge. And then we have 
literacy across disciplines. This is the more important, uh, the most important models between these three models, because it is something related to, to your decision, your thinking, your thoughtfully and wisely uh, using technology. And it says that when something is suitable in one context and for one um, um, groups of learners, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily uh, useful for other contexts of other learners. So this is uh, the most important uh, model in digital literacy. Uh, let's move to my second part of the uh, uh, presentation, why digital literacy is important. Um, because of shortage of time, let me uh, skip this. Just I um, point to one important thing that uh, digital literacy makes something in our society that all of these reasons, these seven reasons that I listed here, make our world a better place for living because of something deep in understanding, in citizenship, in expanding the concepts and thoughtfully decision and improving uh, technology. And my uh, third part and last part of the, uh, my presentation is uh, how to be digitally literate. Um, as I told you, to be digitally literate, um, you should acquire two kinds of skills, cognitive skills in one side and technical skills in the other side. Let's see what they are. Cognitive skills are human skills which can be developed through um, teaching and learning and practice. Among these skills on the screen, you can see that critical thinking and creative problem solving are most valued and creativity and collaboration are um, placed second. And the list continued with two important concepts, uh, copyright and digital citizenship concept. Uh, if somebody would like to be digitally literate, they should be familiar with all of these uh, concepts. If you know, um, please um, consider yourself and uh, see which of these cognitive skills do you have and which are not. And if you, um, you are skillful in, one of, um, in all of these concepts, that's okay. But uh, if you um, think that you need some extra um, learning situations to um, learn these concepts, I can uh, introduce you uh, a platform, a very useful platform, Coursera.org, as I write it here. And um, it is a platform for, uh, that uh, very famous universities around the world put their courses on it. And uh, you can go through it, search for all of these skills, the cognitive skills, and uh, take part in their courses till you um, get your certificate. And um, technical skills, one of the um, parts of this digital literacy. Technical skills are familiarity with using these categories uh, with special tools. And this table shows the categories, the sample tool, and its implication. As you see in the table, um, First, we have text. Digitally literate people um, should be familiar with page design, with layout for both print and digital publishing. And uh, the second category is, um, and the uh, tool, excuse me, and the tool um, appropriate for it is InDesign. And the second category is Image. You can use Photoshop for leverage, for editing photos, images, and for other visuals, for creating vector graphics and sharing um, data or content, for example, infographics and diagrams, you can use Illustrator. Illustrator is an, an example for um, working with other visuals. And um, a digitally literate people 
can uh, person can um, work with audios, audio recording, mixing, restoration. You can use audition as an example for audio editing, recording, and somehow some things like that. And uh, the other category is video. Um, using Premiere, um, digitally literate people can create, edit, publish interactive videos. And for interactive animations, you can use Animate. And for, for multimedia, you can use mixing text. Um, multimedia is mixing text, image, sound, and other medias together. And you can use Captivate to create such multimedias. multimedias. And um, I want to explain something that these tools are just an example. And if um, maybe they are somehow complex, but if you search from in, um, in, the, in, uh, in the internet, you can use um, special tools who uh, maybe they are uh, suitable for you. If you consider yourself a skillful in using these categories, I told you that's okay. But if you think that um, you need some uh, courses to uh, improve your skills, you can go to other platform. Another platform that I introduce here is lynda.com. It's a perfect uh, platform that has uh, too many different courses. They are uh, very simpler, they're very shorter than uh, something that we, uh, we have in MOOCs and Coursera. And um, you can enjoy it uh, at the same time you learn uh, these skills. But something that is more important that, um, than uh, cognitive skills and um, technical skills is selecting suitable tools. Selecting suitable tools is based on your audience needs. It needs your deep understanding about your audience. Maybe in medical education, your audience is uh, students, maybe in practice, it is your patients, and it is very important to uh, you know deeply your audience needs. And if your audience needs to do something, please use face to face classes or simulation. And if your audience needs to see but without movement, use text and images. Why I'm saying so because nowadays all people want to use multimedias and animations and videos. They say they think that they are very richer uh, medias, but um, they are not. Um, if you know deeply your audience, uh, based on it, you uh, use suitable media for them. For example, maybe sometimes it is text and image, but not audio or video. And if your audience needs to listen and see, but without movement, you can use audio, or nowadays we call it um, podcasts. But if your audience need to watch, listen with movement, so you can use video, animation, multimedia. Uh, to move forward, remember these three messages. Use the technology thoughtfully and wisely. See the technology not for its sake, but for its creative potential. And remember that you are not a tech expert. You are a medical teacher. So understand the technology deeply to unlock your teaching potential, not just using applications and tools. Oh, again, this picture. And, um, to summarize, I want you something now, uh, you know, components of digital literacy and the categories of them, but uh, let's see what the next steps are. Um, it's a kind of roadmap I've, um, write, I've, brought, uh, I've written here. Um, assess, first assess your abilities deeply, deeply and honestly. Maybe if, uh, you, um, uh, understand that um, you feel that your skills are not good, but uh, maybe it is a white um, carrot <laughs> deeper in the ground. And so assess your abilities deeply, 
determine your strengths and weaknesses, prioritize your weaknesses, develop your personal plan, and implement your plan after that. Hope this presentation gave you some insight as to what digital literacy is and uh, that you use it to your advantage in the future. Thank you all again. If uh, anyone has a question, I'm ready for it. Thank you, Dr. Merabi. It was wonderful, excellent presentation. Thank uh, you. Any questions so far, Dr. Merabi, before we open up for panel discussion? Okay. Please. All right. So I've been seeing a lot of uh, messages coming. And uh, before we move to overall panel discussion. I have one question for Dr. Mohammadi. One of the things that uh, we hear is, is there a possibility, you know, one of the most important things as a physician is the human touch. With artificial intelligence, how much would that, or machine learning or big data, affect our doctor-patient relationship? Can you please address that, Dr. Mohammadi. Okay, thank you for uh, the question. Uh, I think that uh, it would be a mandatory for future uh, physicians to use uh, machine uh, learning in their uh, practice. Uh, all universities and, uh, sorry, Okay, all universities and uh, medical colleges are persuaded to uh, use machine learning for decision making for individualized uh, medicine. And I think uh, we have no way uh, except, uh, in, for, uh, except using big data in our decisions in, in medicine. Thank you, thank you. Now, there have been a very interesting chat discussion going on. Uh, it's very difficult for me to summarize it. Uh, Dr. Zaidi uh, sent a message that digital e-learning is nothing uh, uh, for the future. It's already here. And we need to invest ourselves. We need to focus on it. We need to really, especially our leaders in education, so that's the way to move forward and to compete in this world. Uh, I would ask our moderator, uh, Mr. Hasnain, uh, th th there are so many chats and comments. Is, is there a way now we can open it up? If people move their hands up, they can ask a direct question. Can we do that, Hasnain? Yes, thanks, Dr. Sen. Uh, I have actually copied some of the questions, so I would ask question uh, first to Dr. Shole. Are you around, Dr. Shole? Can you unmute yourself, please? Dr. Baloch, can uh, you write the yes, question? Yes, I'm here. Okay. So the first question they ask, do you recommend using mobile learning through platform or through social media platform? Uh, we can use both of them. We can use okay. mobile learning for social medias as they're available everywhere and the connection with them is very easy. For example, WhatsApp or Skype, all of these platforms can be used for our classes. And they're easy to use and they're free for everyone. In addition to those platforms, we have some platforms that are prepared by uh, higher education institutes. For example, uh, we have uh, the 3B platform, we have Zoom or uh, Adobe Connect. All of these platforms are provided by schools and in addition to these platforms which are uh, shared by uh, different companies, each institute has its own learning management system. And via its learning management system or LMS, it shares the content with students and give them the opportunity to use the platforms whenever they want to and at their own pace and anytime, any day. 
Yeah, so what do you think about having a system thinking is better framework to understand learning at both micro and macro level? What do you do? Or you want to comment on anything? Okay. Uh, yeah, system thinking, system thinking okay. is better framework to understand mm -hmm. learning both at micro and macro level. Uh, of course, you know, when you are talking of instructional design, you, you'd better think of systematic approaches of instructional design during teaching learning process. And if uh, you don't think systematically, you will lose uh, many things. You know, in my opinion, teaching and learning is, the, is not a matter of try and error. You know, you should be careful because there is no pilot study. The first group of learners are the serious ones that are, uh, you know, receiving what you have designed. And uh, they are trying to learn from your expertise, knowledge, and whatever you are going to uh, help them to learn. I'm not going to use the word teaching, you know, I try to be passive, help them to learn. So uh, being systematic uh, thinker would help a teacher to be a leader in the classroom, whether it is e-learning platforms, synchronous fund, asynchronous fund, or clinical education on any other part. And when it comes to micro learning, it, is, it needs more innovation. It needs more intelligence. And I think good teachers are capable to provide good, you know, powerful and just to point micro assets, whether it is micro videos, contents, or uh, micro assignments, micro quizzes, they need expertise and intelligence, I do believe. And if I want to give you an experience, for our MOOCs platform, uh, we asked um, some of our good, uh, you know, teachers in universities of medical sciences to provide us uh, with, uh, you know, short micro learning videos around maybe maximum 10 to 15 minutes. And the first hand uh, productions that came to us, we reviewed them and we encountered that most of them are so easy. For example, just the name of the disease, the definition, epidemiology, and that's it, finished. And I, I understood there that most of, even our uh, intelligent faculty members are not uh, familiar with the concept of lighter could be heavier, you know? And when we ask them to have a short lecture, they start to, say, to uh, present easy part of their course. And they chunk it, you know, cut the content into chunks. It's not the uh, concept of micro learning. It's absolutely right to do that. For example, instead of providing a 19 minute lecture, I divide it to 10 nine minute talks. It's, it's wrong. You should redesign for being so being systematic thinker for micro learning is much more difficult uh, when you compare it with macro learning, usual uh, routine, traditional teaching that we have. Thank you. Any other question from Hasnain? Yeah. Okay, so the next question to Dr. Rita. Do you think micro learning need much work from faculties? How you could overcome this challenge with majority of teachers who not want to have extra work? Uh, yes, <laughs> I do agree. And that's a nice question. You know, in our experience in Iran during this uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, faculty members had to develop lots of e-contents, you know, in their home at their home. And they didn't have any experience of creating content, even with maybe many of them, even with PowerPoint, simple PowerPoint uh, recordings, you know? And uh, the point that uh, we tried to uh, tell them and uh, try to train this uh, concept to our uh, university faculty members is that they, they can provide learners with micro learning uh, videos and besides that, they can, for example, study the textbook. The micro-learning content could help, our, can help our learners 
to understand the complicated parts of the textbook even, you know? But that is very hard because as I told you in the next previous question, uh, you know, um, for example, it was much more easier for me to talk about micro learning for about 40 minutes. It took time from me to make it short to eight to nine minutes, minutes you know? So uh, you should rethink. And then we ask them, uh, I think the best solution that I can suggest that provide them with samples. What worked was that for training faculty members to be good e-teachers, we provided them with micro learning content. And many of them provided the feedback that listening to that micro learning content of e-teaching, for example, capacities, uh, assessment in medical education and so on, help them to have a role model in their mind. And when it comes to medical faculties, because they, they have practical nature, you know, they're pragmatic, role models and samples works the best compared to providing lecture about micro learning, for example. You know, when, when they still listen to their samples, they learn how, how to do the same in their own courses. But it is difficult. I do agree with uh, the colleague that has asked this question. MashaAllah, yeah. thank you very much. Now, uh, we have limited time available to us. So I will ask Hasnan uh, uh, to pick up another two questions. Please send your questions. What Shifa, what we would like to do is to accumulate those questions and send it to the speakers and they can provide a written response to that, it's almost impossible. There's some, so many interesting questions which are coming up. Just to let you know, there, was a, there were more than 131 participants in this webinar. It's a highly successful, thanks to all of you, especially who have participated, especially Shifa and Hasnan. So please, uh, uh, Hasnan, if you can uh, provide another two yeah. questions. Uh, just, just before, if you, Dr. Rita, you allow me the question I asked last, uh, just to add on, like we have uh, inter-exchangeable learning objects concept, where if you, you develop some micro learning object or artifacts, could we put it like open educational resource and all other institutions or faculties can use that? So that would be a great you know, idea. What do you think, Dr. Rita? Uh, thank you for your suggestion. Uh, that would be great. Maybe in this, uh, you know, uh, SIBU, we can uh, have a platform for open resources. Even uh, yeah. I think that the lectures that are provided here, we can record it in a better manner. You know, when you are uh, asynchronous, you record better, of course. And we can provide all these micro assets and learning objects, as you said in that platform and it would be my honor if I can uh, provide that platform with some assets if I can. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, uh, one question to Dr. Ayn Muhammadi. Um, do, do you have any statistics about how many institutions they are using artificial intelligence? Excellent. Uh, Dr. Ayn, you need to unmute, please. Yes. Yeah. Please ask your question again. Uh, do you have any statistics or number of institutions, uh, maybe in your country or regionally, those uh, th these institutions which are using artificial intelligence uh, for teaching and learning or for medical education? Okay, of course, uh, it's uh, a new uh, technology in Iran and uh, uh, there is not uh, common in all universities, but we have some institutions, especially uh, bioinformatics and the group, departments of bioinformatics, departments of e-health and departments of e-learning in some uh, universities in Iran, like Tehran universities, uh, Mashhad, uh, Tabriz, uh, Shiraz, have uh, some institutions that work on uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, yes. Good, good, good. thank you. Yeah. Well, let me respond to that uh, in a different way from US perspectives. Almost all major academic centers now have medical informatics, which means that e-learning, 
uh, big data training, machine learning is part of training. And as a part of this, it goes back as early as first and second year of medical schools. So there are proper curriculums which are being now implemented in the training of medical students. And we wish that some of this, we can also do that in the rest of the other parts of the world. It is critical as we move forward. In terms of clinical care, and I'm sure Dr. Ayin would know uh, better, some fields, just like radiology, pathology, which depends on large data sets, are pretty much are now dependent. They work closely with the radiologist or with the pathologist. They are not completely independent. As a matter of fact, that if you look at the data, recent studies coming out from mammograms, that artificial intelligence has a better sensitivity and specificity in terms of diagnosing breast cancer. Obviously, there need to be a human touch. There need to be an oncologist. There need to be a radiologist involved in transmitting all that information. But my friends, my colleagues, moving forward, we have no choice than to adopt to this technology. This the four presentations that we have just as outstanding. And they're the first step for us to move forward in this direction. I would also just make a last ditch request. Is there a possibility that we can have these slides available to Saudi International Virtual Universities so that it is in our library and can be used by people as needed? And uh, Snan, you and Shifa can get back to the speakers to get their formal permissions. Okay. okay. Last but not the least, again, my mentor, Shabi Zaidi, had promoted us. And many of you know, somebody mentioned Corsica. Corsica provides basic Cors course. Coursera, yes. sorry, Dr. Coursera. Yeah. Basic course on artificial intelligence. It's the free courses available to us. There are 10 top three listed. The number one is from MIT. I mean, I actually went to Stanford face-to-face, one-to-one. That is an excellent by Dr. Lee. Take that course. You have, and it's a six weeks course. You spend that time, that's a basic. It's not necessarily related to medical field but it's important to all of us to have a better understanding of machine learning, artificial learning. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, we are almost out Excuse of me, Professor, may sure. I uh, say a, a short comment? As you know, in Iran, we have two type of universities, medical universities that are supervised with the Minister of Health and Medical Education and non-medical universities, uh, which are supervised with the uh, Ministry of Education. Uh, what, we, uh, what I said about uh, new uh, coming technologies uh, like artificial uh, intelligence in, uh, is in medical universities. In non-medical and engineers, they have uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, brilliant activities that are now uh, in the region uh, in this Phil, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. I, mean, I think what's important with this whole group, we are the intellectuals, we are the cream of the society. What needs to happen, and it is already you guys have shown us, there needs to be a combination. We need to come together with medical university coming together with the IT, engineering, biomedical, and for the future of our field. With that, I will ask to end this symposia. Thank you yes. very much for your participation. It was wonderful and have a blessed day, good day. Asalaamu Alaikum. Thank you very Salam. much. I, I, uh, sorry, I need to announce uh, that we sure. will be having second global e-learning workshop uh, on 15th of August. 
the title of workshop is uh, will be item analysis for evaluation of applied knowledge test so you will be getting soon you know the link to register for this workshop so thanks for your time it was a great uh, session actually and thanks for all participants and presenters thanks dr thank you shobhi bhai thank you shobhi bhai thank you very much